Welcome back, everyone. This time on You Could Have Invented Homology, we're going to talk about the structure of simplices and how it leads to the big idea that gives us homology. But first, in the last video, I said in the description that the first person to find the mistake I made in the voiceover would get a special prize. The first person to find it was YouTube user NeoJDL. So here's your prize, NeoJDL. I drew this for you. If we look at a simplex, we can see that it has two parts. It has an outside shell called the boundary and a soft fleshy innard, the so-called interior, which is what's left when the boundary is removed. Now, an N simplex is actually homeomorphic to the space that you get when you take a sphere whose surface has dimension N-1 and fill it in, take its convex hull, which is called a closed N bowl. This space can also be constructed as the set of vectors in Rn whose distance from some fixed point x is less than or equal to some fixed radius r. You can show this by taking the simplex and blowing it up until it's round. One of the consequences of this is that the interior of an N simplex is homeomorphic to Rn. To see this, take the interior of an N simplex and apply a homeomorphism with the closed N ball of radius pi over 2 centered at the origin in Rn. Now, scale each of the resulting points by the tangent of its magnitude. Since tan goes to infinity as you approach pi over 2 from below, and each of our points has magnitude up to but not including pi over 2, this stretches our ball over the whole Rn. This map, the map that first blows up the interior till it's round, and then stretches it over Rn, is a homeomorphism between the interior of our n simplex and Rn. We can only do this because we're not including the boundary. Any point only gets stretched by a finite amount, but we can stretch more and more as we get closer to the missing boundary. So the interior of the simplex can be stretched without bound. This is a theme in topology. A space with a missing boundary is boundless. So. When I said that an N simplex is like a captured piece of n dimensional space, that was literal. An N simplex is Rn squished into a shell, like some topological hermit crab. But hang on. If us topologists only care about topological spaces up to homeomorphism, and simplices are homeomorphic to closed balls, then why are we talking about simplices rather than closed balls? Aren't they just the same as far as we care? We're making a choice here by paying attention to simplices, so we need to justify it. The reason is the boundary. The interior of a simplex is boring, at least as far as algebraic topologists care. It's just featureless blank Rn. The boundary is where simplices get interesting. Before we start looking at the boundary, I want to take a moment to introduce a new notation. If we have points v0 to vn in some Euclidean space, and it is best for us to start the indexing at 0, then we'll list them in square brackets to denote their convex hull. This is a standard notation and much nicer to look at than the notation we used in the last video, so I'll use it from here on. So, an n simplex, such as this 3 simplex x, is the convex hull of its n plus 1 vertices, v0 to vn. If we take the convex hull of some, but not all, of these vertices, we get a simplex of lower dimension, which sits inside the boundary of x. 
If we omit just one of the vertices of x, and take the convex hull of the n remaining, then we get simplices of dimension 1 less than that of x, which we call the faces of x. Together, the faces of x cover the whole boundary of x. The boundary of an n simplex, then, consists of n minus 1 simplices. This is important. If we look to the boundary of a simplex, we still end up talking about simplices, and even simpler simplices too, since they have a lower dimension. Notice that each face corresponds to exactly one vertex, the one that it emits, which lies on the opposite side of the simplex. This means that the faces of a simplex are in one-to-one -one correspondence with the vertices of that simplex. Every face is opposite to a vertex, and every vertex is opposite to a face. When we use this square bracket notation to write the face of a simplex, we'll sometimes write in the emitted vertex, but with a little hat, to emphasize the removal of that vertex, which is harder to see when you just don't write it in. Now, a closed n ball has a boundary too, a sphere of dimension n minus 1. Notice that this is not the same as a closed n minus 1 ball. So in the case of closed balls, looking to the boundary doesn't just give us a lower dimensional space, it gives us a different kind of space altogether. Now, the boundary of an n simplex is not homeomorphic to an n minus 1 simplex. It, too, is homeomorphic to an n minus 1 dimensional sphere. But the point is that it breaks up into n minus 1 simplices. This is true for closed balls, too. The boundary of a closed n ball breaks up into closed n minus 1 balls. But the difference is that, since the ball is perfectly uniform, it doesn't come with built-in lines along which to cut the boundary. So, in order to decompose the boundary into lower dimensional balls, we'd have to choose our own boundaries for the faces, and we hate making choices. Plus, if our choice of face boundaries cuts the boundary up into n plus 1 faces, then we're basically describing a homeomorphism between the closed ball and the simplex anyway, since from here we can just flatten the faces to get a simplex. This is a good indication that it makes more sense to just consider simplices in the first place without trying to ham-fistedly force closed balls to act like simplices. One of the reasons why the boundaries of simplices are so great is that they fit together. For instance, we can tile the plane with two simplices effortlessly, and they fit together like topological Lego. Doing this with closed two balls would involve distorting them, and it would mean, again, probably ending up essentially using a homeomorphism between the closed two ball and the two simplex anyway. Since we want to use our simple spaces to study complicated spaces, we're going to want them to fit together nicely, so it looks like simplices are the natural choice after all. At this point, you might be asking, what's the boundary of a zero simplex? The boundary of a two simplex is easy enough to see, and if you tilt your head and squint your eyes, you might be able to convince yourself to use the word boundary for the endpoints of a one simplex, but a zero simplex? If we want our pattern to continue, the boundary of a zero simplex should consist of minus one simplices, but there's no such thing. The solution, at least for now, is to exclude zero simplices from the definition. We simply won't talk about the boundary of a zero simplex for now. So, where's this all going? Why do we care so much about simplices and their boundaries, and how are we going to actually, concretely, use them to learn more about topological spaces? Well, we're ready now to meet the big idea of homology. 
Suppose we have some mystery space x. A continuous function from the standard 1 simplex delta 1 traces out a line segment in x. Possibly distorted, but never broken. Suppose we have three such functions, and suppose their endpoints line up like so. Then we get something that looks like, or at least looks like it could be, the boundary of a 2 simplex. So we can ask the question, is it? More precisely, is there a continuous function from the standard 2 simplex delta 2 into x, such that the boundary of delta 2 is mapped onto our three squiggly line segments? Can we fill in the space enclosed by our lines? Possibly surprisingly, this is not always true. If this is happening in the plane R2, then there's no problem. We'll never have trouble filling in a triangle in the plane, so let's try a different space. Suppose X is a cylinder, something like a short, fat, hollow straw. If we draw our one simplicity so that they loop around the cylinder, then something interesting happens. Any function from delta 2 into this space, by definition, maps delta 2 onto the outside of the straw, since x is just the outside, it's hollow. So if it takes the boundary of delta 2 to our chosen lines, then it has to somehow wrap its interior around the outside. But since our lines form a full loop, it's impossible to do this without piercing the simplex. See for yourself. Try stretching the opening of a balloon over a cardboard tube and see if you can make the whole balloon sit snugly on the outside of the tube without cutting a hole in the balloon. After a while, you should find yourself agreeing that it can't be done. Now, this doesn't constitute a proof. Far from it. We'll be able to prove this later, but it takes a surprising amount of machinery to rigorously prove this intuitive result but it contains the idea. So, any function from delta 2 to the cylinder, which takes the boundary of delta 2 to our loop, is necessarily discontinuous. If we restrict ourselves to considering continuous functions, then our loop can't be filled in. We found a boundary with no interior. The idea of homology is to ask the question, which apparent boundaries are true boundaries, and which are just the shells of simplices that can never be? If we ask this question in a very particular way, we'll uncover a genuinely surprising sort of spatial algebra that is, at least to me, just so delightful. In this way, we can detect features of the overall geometric structure of topological spaces using nothing but continuous maps from simplices and some algebra. In the next video, we'll start to figure out how best to ask the big question of homology. I hope you're as excited about it as I am. Thanks for watching, and as always, big thanks to my patrons over at patreon.com slash See you next time.